Good evening. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the fourth lecture in Boston Ujima Project's Black Trust 2018 Chapter in Arts and Lecture Series featuring Charlotte Brathwaite and Jessica Gordon and Hart. My name is Mia Evans and I'm with Boston Ujima Project. Boston Ujima Project is a community control finance investment ecosystem that is democratically run by Boston's working class communities of color. Boston Ujima Project is a concrete solution. We are creating our own agendas for our communities and we are implementing these agendas ourselves. For those of you who are not familiar with Boston Ujima Project, we are coming together and pooling our resources in a community fund where every voting member will have an equal vote on the businesses, real estate, and community initiatives we will invest in. And we are ensuring the success of our investments by supporting them with going out of our way to shop at those businesses, advocating for policies that support our communities like paying a living wage and providing youth employment opportunities and encouraging large institutions to contract with our businesses, treat workers justly, and give back to our communities creating a cooperative economics infrastructure that allows us to meet our needs. Welcome. So we just screened Only What Is Dark Enough Can You See the Stars, directed and produced by Charlotte Brathwaite, who is here with us tonight. <laughs> Director Charlotte Brathwaite is known for her unique approach to staging classical and unconventional texts, dance, visual art, multimedia, site-specific installation, video, film, performance art, plays, and music events. Her work has been seen in the Americas, Africa, Europe, the Caribbean, and Asia, and ranges in subject matter from the historical past to the distant future, eliminating issues of race, sex, power, and the complexities of the human condition. Brathwaite is recipient of several awards and citations, including the Prelude Festival, Frankie Award, for, I can't read my own writing, so I might get, I might get some of this wrong, uh, the Brown Institute Magic Grant, the Princess Grace George C. Wolf Award, the Julian Milton Kaufman Prize from Yale, a Rockefeller Residency with Kyle Abraham, AIM, and the National Performing Network Creation Fund. She has continued collaborations with noted artists such as Michelle and Gail Cello, Peter Sellers, Flutronics, Aisha Jordan, and others. She received her MFA at the Yale School of Drama and her BA in Physical Theater at the, at the Amsterdam School for the Arts in the Netherlands. She has been a visiting professor at Amherst College, the University of Fonda Leza, Unifor, say that? Fonda Leza uh, in Brazil, and visiting artist at Williams College, New York University, and Barbados Community College. Brathway is currently a freelance director and assistant professor of music and theater arts at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So we will hear more from Charlotte during the Q&A after Jessica's talk. So thank you and welcome Charlotte. Now we will hear from Jessica, author of Collective Courage, a study of African cooperative economic thought and practice, and 2016 inductee into the U.S. Cooperative Hall of Fame. Dr. Jessica gordon Empart is Professor of Community Justice and Social Economic Development, Chair of the African, Africana Studies Department, and Director of the McNair post Baccalaureate Achievement Program at John Jay College, City University of New York. She is also an affiliate scholar with the Center for the Study of Cooperatives at the University of Saskatchewan, Canada, and the 2017 recipient of a CASC Merit Award for Exemplary Contributions to the Field of Cooperative Studies, uh, Canadian Association for Studies and Cooperation. Dr. Gordon Nimhart is a political economist specializing in community economics, black political economy, and popular economic literacy. Her research and numerous publications explore problematics and alternative solution and alternative solutions in cooperative economic development and worker ownership, community economic development, racial wealth inequality, credit unions, and community-based asset building and community-based approaches to justice. So thank you, Jessica, and welcome. Great to see some faces, familiar faces, and to meet the rest of you. So I want to talk tonight about um, African American cooperatives, activism, and economic justice. 
And I think we have a PowerPoint coming up. Um, first, I want to acknowledge thanks to the organizers, and I just want to acknowledge our ancestors, the original occupants and stewards of the land, who I think are what the Massachusetts, the Wampum, Narragansa, etc. nations. And also to recognize the struggles of enslaved laborers and all those who continue to struggle and work without just compensation in a racialized, capitalist, colonial land. And finally, I stand on the shoulders of those who have used cooperatives or tried to use cooperatives as a form of liberation. So I want to start, I want to start with a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois from 1907. Yes. Um, this was actually the statement after he had a conference on uh, black business and cooperative development in 1907 at Atlanta University, part of his Atlanta conferences on, on blacks, I guess he called them, or Negro Americans, I think he called them in those days. And he says, we unwittingly stand on the crossroads, or actually, wittingly and hesitatingly stand at the crossroads, one way leading to the old trodden <coughs> path, grasping fierce individualistic competition to get what we want at any expense, and the other way leading to cooperation in capital and labor, the massing of small savings, and creating distribution of capital so that we have more uh, fair distribution of wealth. I argue that we're still at that crossroads, or we're at those crossroads again in the 21st century. So yeah, I, I'm going to argue that we're at those, we're still at those crossroads. In fact, I think in 1907 we were still kind of going the capitalist, individualistic route mostly. Though uh, those of you who know my book know that there were some exceptions to that rule. I think we've still been going that route, but that we're at a crossroads again, and we can choose the path that we want. <clears throat> the crossroads, I was trying to describe the conditions we're under, which I think most of you know, and I try not to um, focus on the bad stuff. I like to talk about the possibilities of the good stuff, but I did want to remind us of all the things that we're fighting against, right? High income inequality, jobless recovery, growing economic and wealth inequality, gentrification and continuation of the old trodden ways, etc. Trumpism. Anyway, uh, next slide. So, co-ops. Why do we say, you know, why do I agree with Du Bois that a cooperative way would probably be a better way? It's really a universal concept. That's one of the things I had to grapple with. I guess it's 20 years ago now when I first got involved in the co-op movement. It was very, very European, white, um, and didn't <clears throat> look like it acknowledged or was that uh, welcoming to people of color, but luckily things have changed in 20 years. But originally, um, all things co-op kind of started in Europe in 1844, which is when the Rochdale pioneers were. But the more some of us started to study this issue, we realized that co-ops have actually been, or cooperative economics, economic cooperation, have actually been the way of life for almost any <coughs> almost any group in almost any era of the world's history um, and almost any place in the world. And certainly uh, a lot of indigenous organizations and a lot of African scholars suggest that the very first economies were really collective economies in the commons, etc. So I like to talk about co-ops really being universal, that all of us have traditions and whatever heritages we have and that we bring and that we recognize. Um, and that we need to understand those precursors, the mutual aid, um, collectivism, the commons, all those things are things that all of us have practiced. And I think we know it in our souls and our hearts. And sometimes it's just a matter of bringing it back, back up. Next slide. So for the African American experience, what I found in the research I've done is that we really did use collective economics uh, as a uh, solution to and reaction to discrimination and oppression. And that was some of the things I was able to find in my book, which I think I talk about later, but I have a few copies for people if anyone wants to get one. Um, and so the notion that 
to survive, but also to persist as human beings, we had to work together and control our economy in a way that was much more collective and supportive of human life and supportive of uh, democracy and democratic participation. African Americans, as other subaltern groups, really came together and often created what we would now call co-ops, but sometimes there were mutual aid societies, etc., to really make a better world. To design and manage goods and services in a way that were much more sensitive to their own culture, to their own values, and um, to make sure to do self-help ventures that could combat the, the oppression and the discrimination. Next slide. So in addition to just this learning and thinking about how African Americans use cooperatives to survive, I also actually found out that there was a parallel, the co-op movement was really parallel to the civil rights movement. And I'm talking about the long civil rights movement, which to me is what started, actually I say here, it started when they were, we were put on boats, forced onto boats against our will, but actually it started before the boats we resisted before we even got shoved onto the boats and carried over to the Western Hemisphere. But that's what I mean by the long civil rights movement, all the efforts at resistance from the very early times. But since I'm focusing on African Americans, I'll focus on when we came to the shores here. Um, and if you look at that long civil rights movement, you actually find not just the fight for legal representation and legal rights and civil rights, but also the fight for economic justice went right along with it, just got, um, became invisible in some ways. We can talk about that at the end if you want to talk about why it was invisible. Next slide. So I did find that this co-op movement among African Americans really does parallel what we would call the civil rights movement, including most of the organizations and people that we recognize in the civil rights movement. If you actually dig deeper, which is what I did, um, you find out they were promoting cooperative economics in their own way, some, some more strongly than others, some were trying to practice it, even though they didn't talk about it. Um, but almost any case, and I sometimes challenge people, give me a civil rights leader, and I could probably tell you about some co-op <coughs> activity they were involved in, or, or co-op philosophy that they held, that kind of thing. So that actually was a surprise to me, because when I first started doing the work, I just wanted to find some examples of African American cooperative economics. I wasn't realizing that there was a whole long movement and a whole connection to the civil rights movement. Next slide. So the other thing that became very obvious and sort of parallels that fact that the co-op movement paralleled the civil rights movement was how important organizations and communities were to the co-op movement for African Americans. And again, I think it's probably the same for other subaltern groups, but the ones I've studied are African American. And what do I mean by that? I mean that where I had the strongest, most prolific development of co-op businesses, cooperatively owned businesses, you also had the strongest, most developed African American organizations that were also teaching cooperative economics in some form after another. So that connection was very important. And then the community connection was also extremely important because most of the co-ops had to be protected by the communities they were in because the mainstream <coughs> white world was very competitive. In fact, a lot of the first grocery stores and things were a way for blacks to, to buy and, and shop at a place that they controlled rather than a place that was controlled by um, white supremacists who either didn't let them try on their clothes or didn't buy the kind of goods they wanted or charged, overcharged them for everything. And so a lot of the early co-ops were just a way to get out of that exploitative system. And so the people who had been exploiting them were not happy about that, obviously. And so if the communities didn't support the co-ops, the co-ops really couldn't function. Even if not everybody in the community was a member of the co-op, the communities had to understand what the co-op was doing had to be supportive of the co-op's existence, and often sometimes had to put their bodies in between the white supremacist violence and the co-op to protect it. 
So that's what I mean when I say community was important in this movement. Um, and that comes up over and over again in some of the examples. So next slide. I tried to give you a sense. It's, I know it's too small. Yeah, there we go. Too small to see everything, but I want to give you a sense of some of the important black organizations that promoted both cooperatives and civil rights. And I'll just mention a couple, the 1880s, and I'm going to talk more about this in a minute, the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union. Actually, a really interesting organization because it was during the black populist movement. It was a, a co-op development association. It was a union, and it was a political party. And you'll see again, I'm going to bring that theme out again in terms of those connections and how important sometimes doing the politics, the economics, and the labor support all, all were, were important, um, what do you call them, connections and, and, and intersections that happened. Um, the Ex-Slave Pension Association actually was fighting for back wages for slaves, which basically means pensions and reparations. But they were also a mutual aid society, and so they had the, the, uh, the cooperative economics piece, but they also had the political piece, etc. And I won't go through all of them because some of them I have examples of later. But you see, there's a, a nice group there. And the other thing to notice a lot of these organizations at their height were the largest black organizations in the country. So again, that combination of strong black organizations that were also actually promoting radical stuff were also the largest. So like in the 1880s, the Colored Farmers National Alliance was actually the largest. They, it's purported to have had about a million members. This is the 1880s at the height of the repression after the reconstruction when the Ku Klux Klan gets started, etc. So it's quite amazing that it was doing all those politics, economics, labor stuff the same time it was under a huge assault by the KKK and a time when the whole country was in retrenchment after having been relatively liberal after the Civil War. So that's my history lesson. Actually, I think I have a little more history lesson. Next slide. Um, first, I wanted to also just get you inspired by some of the black activists and what they said about co-ops. Um, du Bois, who I told you about, we started with him in the beginning. He actually wrote a book that he launched at that 1907 conference called um, Economic Cooperation Among Negro Americans. But he wrote a lot of editorials in the Crisis Magazine, which is the NAACP magazine, and other places about the importance of cooperative economics for blacks. And one of his theories was that the way that African Americans could really get out of being a subaltern, marginalized group is if we voluntarily segregated ourselves to create co-ops that we controlled, created a kind of commonwealth of co-ops where we interlocked and served and uh, had co-ops that, um, I don't know, uh, supplied each other, co-ops that supplied each other, um, and then we wouldn't need the outside world, but we could grow our own strength satisfy all our needs and grow our own wealth and then integrate from a position of power and, and wealth. So that was one of Du Bois's notions. Um, I've got, next slide, got a quote from John Lewis, who was a SNCC leader in the 60s and is now still in Congress from Atlanta. He talked about the early the SNCC years in the 60s when they went around helping people create co-ops. And he was talking about survival first and then control over your own economics. So, you know, people could vote, meaning they finally got the vote. So civil rights in that sense had been successful, but they were still starving. So there was more work to be done. And you'll see I have a theme in here that we can't really achieve true social or political rights and power without economic justice. And that's one of the things John Lewis was saying. Fannie Lou Hamer, another famous voting rights activist. Is that the next slide? Yeah. Um, talks about developing the total community, that it's only through cooperative ownership of land that we can really develop ourselves as a full community. Um, and she actually started a co-op farm and co-op and affordable housing and some other things. And again, that whole notion, we start with controlling land, feed ourselves, and then do all the other things we need to do as a collective. 
Next, A. Philip Randolph, who most of you know, um, the March on Washington movement, as well as the founder of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union. He just said it very simply, co-ops are the best way we know to create economic democracy. And then, next slide. So that's why we can't achieve political or economic justice without economic justice. And that's pretty much what all the different black leaders said in different ways, in varying ways, and depending on how politic it was, said it stronger or quieter, depending on what context they were in. Next slide. Why do I say that we can't achieve political and social justice without economic justice? Most of you are probably here because you already understand that, but I'll go through some of my reasons anyway. One, and this actually came from Fannie Lou Hamer, because there's economic retaliation when you try to fight for your political and social rights. People in the South who were fighting for their voting rights in the 60s found this out all the time. Fannie Lou Hamer and her husband were sharecroppers. The minute they registered to vote, they came home from registering to vote and all their crop, all their goods were on the street. They were thrown off of the land that they were sharecropping. And that happened over and over and over again. So that's the economic retaliation. You can't even keep a job, keep your livelihood if you fight for your political rights. So that means you need a livelihood that's not controlled by the dominant group, the masters, the oppressors, etc. And co-ops are one way to do that. Um, and then you go use a, um, a John Lewis argument. Even if you get the vote, if you can't eat, right? If you're in a capitalist exploitative system and you can't eat, then having the vote wasn't enough. So you still need something else. You need to do something else. Um, also, the notion that some people can make it out, right? Can get wealth, can make it out, but then the rest of the community is left suffering. That's also back to Fannie Lou Hamer, whether it's really the total community we want to develop, or a Du Bois, who also talked about that. We all, right, his second way that we could go would be where we all prosper, not just a few of us prosper and forget about the rest. So that's another reason we need economic justice and economic democracy. Um, I also argue that with economic that we can't practice real democracy without economic democracy. Even if we all can have a say in a vote, have majority rule and representative democracy, if you think about economic democracy and the way cooperatives and collectives work, everybody's voice matters. It's usually you're talking about a consensus rather than a majority, you're talking about equity rather than just equality, etc. And those things really matter when you're thinking about impact and how to really make a difference for, again, the total community. So that's another argument there. We also know that the wealthy rule electoral politics. So back to a Du Bois strategy, if we don't get control of wealth ourselves, if we don't get wealthy ourselves, we can't control the rest of the systems. And then finally, poverty and economic injustice actually divert our energy, right? We spend so much time trying to work, trying to make a living, trying to feed our families, trying to keep a roof over our heads. We don't have time to be activists. We don't have time to really fight the humane fight. And so they divert us by keeping us basically oppressed economically. So no matter what rights and legal things we gain, we still haven't really won true liberation. And so again, those are sort of my I'm sure you can think of some other reasons, but those are my basic reasons why we need to really continue to fight for economic justice, that those other things aren't enough. Next slide. Ray Marshall, who actually I don't think is a black man, but he is a southerner. He was um, Secretary of Labor under Carter. He also had a beautiful quote about um, using cooperatives for economic independence so that you could then fight for other things. So I wanted to put his quote there. And then uh, Helena Wilson, one of my favorites who nobody knows. Um, she was, for 35 years, she was international president of the Ladies Auxiliary to the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And in a minute, I'll talk more about that. But she also, she used to write articles in the, the masses, is that what it was called? Black Worker, sorry. Black Worker, I think, was the, 
Brotherhood's magazine. She used to write articles in there about cooperative economics and why all black people should learn and know about cooperatives and start them and stuff. And you see there, she talked about no race can really be an equal if it doesn't control its own economy and its own economics. And the way we can do that again is pooling our resources and creating cooperatives. And finally, and my, another one of my favorite quotes, next slide, is Du Bois has an even, actually has a bunch of great quotes, but this one I think is the most powerful because this is again about that taking control and not letting anybody else turn us around. Right, we can by consumers and producers cooperation establish a progressively self-supporting economy that will wield the majority of our people into an impregnable economic phalanx. So there's a lot of terms in there, right? The majority of our people, impregnable, right? Self-supporting economy, um, consumer and producer, cooperation and ownership, etc. But again, there's, that's that vision, right? We come together to do this together, and then nobody can oppress us. Next slide. So there, that's a, another picture of the book. So I learned about all those people and more who support cooperatives by doing the research that then became this book. I think I probably have way too many slides, so I learned next to kind of go through some historical examples two slides of the benefits and components that I found in African American cooperatives, and then I may go quickly through some of the examples. Um, and then you can ask me about some of the other ones. So let's go to important components, that's next. So again, most of you who've been in this solidarity economy work know pretty much what the components are. We need adequate resources and management, training and financing. We need human energy and enthusiasm. Sometimes we don't think about that one, but that one's extremely important when working together. We need solidarity and trust among ourselves, internal education, study groups, and public education about what we're doing and how to do it. We need local control and intercooperation. We need to incorporate young people, and we need to recognize women's leadership. All these things I actually found from my research, but as I said, I think anyone who does this work pretty much has realized these things. Next. And then additional benefits that we can think of from cooperatives. They anchor economic activity, recycle resources, they employ community members, donate to community, they allow us to leverage pooled resources, they promote transparency, and promote leadership. Next slide. So now I did want to go through a couple of historical examples because they're, they exemplify pretty much all the themes I've already been telling you about the connection between politics, labor, economics, the intersectionality of things, and trying to sort of control as much of the total community as possible in order to really make real progress economically. Um, so, as I said, I think I probably have too many examples. I'll do a couple of them, then maybe I'll skip some and end with the young people ones that I've got. And then if you want to talk about some of the other ones that I skipped over, you can ask me about them as a question and answer. Is anyone keeping time? <laughs> okay, so let me just keep moving. You can all, I'll try to tell if you guys are starting to look bored or something out. <laughs> I'll notice it to wind it up, right? Okay, so first is really interesting, the 1880s. Populism, oops, is that nice? Oh yeah, go next one. Yeah, populism, labor, co-ops, all working together. Um, it turns out when you study the early labor unions, even though we know that most of labor union history was actually about exclusion of black workers. But the very early ones in the 1880s and 1890s, most of the 1880s were actually extremely progressive on the race issue and the economics issue. And the labor unions like the Knights of Labor, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, actually promoted integration, support for black and women workers, 
and co-op development, worker co-op development, so workers actually owning their own means of production. They got battered for this. Remember, I already said the 1880s were a horrible period in our history, sort of like now. Um, they got battered for it. They had to go underground a lot. But they set the tone and a precedent and an example for how we could combine and intersect all these issues in a way that really made sense. And they were connected to the populist movement in that time, the black and the white populist movement, which was trying to get regain control over the political side. But they were also doing all this economic innovative work on um, promoting women labor, women's labor rights, black labor rights, cooperative ownership, et cetera. Next slide. So the Knights of Labor are the most well-known and the most progressive of the unions at that time, but there were a bunch of small unions. Um, I think I put the other one, yeah, cooperative workers also. Let me do cooperative workers first because the next slide is also about Knights of Labor. So cooperative workers was a smaller union, but a union in the South that again realized that if you didn't connect black and white workers, you couldn't make any labor for progress with labor unions. They also believed in living wages, which is not what they called it in those days, and cooperative ownership, et cetera. They actually organized co-op stores, a free cooperative school system, and um, uh, electoral reform policies in any of the places where they had strong chapters. They also were willing to use black organizers and uh, black union members, which was rare for some of the other unions. And then back to the Knights of Labor, um, was a larger union than the cooperative workers and lasted a little bit longer, probably eight to 10 years, where the cooperative workers probably lasted four to five years. The Knights of Labor eventually, in its 10 year of history, organized 200 industrial co ops, meaning uh, worker owned co ops. Pretty good uh, track record there promoted women's and black leadership. As I said, let's move to the next slide. The Richmond, Virginia example of what the Knights of Labor was able to accomplish is a really fascinating one, and then I'll move faster through. But again, it's combining the politics, labor, women's issues, black issues, co-op issues all together. So the Knights of Labor in Richmond, Virginia in the 1880s um, had segregated chapters, so the black workers couldn't sit in the same room as white workers because of Virginia law, but they created parallel chapters and uh, labor districts. And the districts then came together and created a campaign to take charge of the city council in Richmond, Virginia in 1884 or 5, 1885. They created what was called the Working Man's Reform Party, and they actually elected enough city council members to take over the city council in 1886. And one of their first major platforms was that the city of Richmond had to rebuild their city hall because when the Confederacy lost at the end of the Civil War, rather than let the Union, the Northerners, take over their city hall, they burned it down as they retreated. So this is, what, 16, 17 years after the Civil War, and they still don't have a new city, what is it called, town, city hall. But the old regime had planned to build the city hall with only white male labor. And the Knights of Labor in Richmond didn't want that. They wanted an integrated workforce, they wanted women, they wanted to use some co-op businesses to help build it, et cetera. Once they won the city council, they were able to put their plan in force, and they actually built the Richmond City Hall with integrated workforce, with women laborers, um, supporting the small co-ops that, the, that the, the union had started, et cetera. So quite an incredible feat that we hardly ever hear about, nobody ever talks about. Um, so that's the kind of thing that was happening. Again, remember this is 1880s, so this horribly repressive time, the Ku Klux Klan is killing people and massacring people, etc. But they're still able to do in pockets throughout the country. We're able to get these incredible coalitions going. Next slide. Out of uh, the Knights of Labor, 
became the um, Colored Farmers United, Colored Farmers National <coughs> Union, and not National, whatever, Association and Cooperative Union. I can never remember the names of anything, sorry. Um, so the Knights of Labor are going underground more and being driven underground and made to disband. The blacks are forming their own union now, realizing they need to be able to control their own union a little bit more. Though, to tell you the honest truth there, our executive director is a white man out of Texas um, because they still needed a white face to conduct some of the negotiations and business. But it's an organization that becomes, as I said, about a million strong. Started in, um, in Texas. Um, and started again as a political party to counteract a lot of the regressive politics, but also as a cooperative development association and a union of black uh, farm workers and black farm owners. So it also has a lot of tensions because you have landowners and farm workers all in the same union so that they, um, they had to struggle sometimes with what that meant and what, you know, what the relationship between the landowners and the farm workers were, et cetera, et cetera. But they, they had a vision of that it would all become cooperative ownership, and so the farm laborers would become co-op owners with the landowners, et cetera. The interesting, you can go to the next one. I think I said most of this already. The, um, the other interesting thing about um, Colored Farmers Alliance was um, how much it took over most of the South for that four to five years that it was strong, and the ways that it um, educated its members to really think about, as I said, this intersectionality of owning your own businesses, fighting for land ownership as well as workers' rights. They started some. Uh, uh, what they call exchanges, which were co -op, what we would call now a co-op grocery store and a lending exchange, etc. The Colored Farmers Alliance was actually really under attack by white supremacist terrorism. And there's um, some great research done about a massacre in Mississippi in 1886, where uh, the white supremacists actually killed, well, killed, I think it was 120, co-op members, and then the co-op, the black co-op had actually shared a co-op with the white farmers alliance, and they forced the white farmers alliance to throw the blacks out of their co-op and not allow them to use their co-op, and they, fo they forced the black co-op to stop printing their newspaper. So you can see they didn't like the information that was happening as well as the economics. Okay, next. Then we fast forward to the 1930s, another period of very prolific co-op development. The Young Negroes Cooperatively started with a call to young Negroes by George Schuyler in his column in the Pittsburgh Courier um, that it was time we think about a new way, that the old folks were more interested in capitalism and security, and it would have to be the young blacks who would take charge and make a new world and start a whole set of interlocking co-ops around the country. Their plan was to um, ask everybody for a dollar. This would be in 1930, in the middle of the Great Depression. If everybody paid a dollar a year, they would have 5,000, and 5,000 people join, they would have $5,000 to use as a co-op development fund. They didn't, they never got more than about 400 members, but the idea, again, was really important, and they had this notion of a co-op commonwealth. Their founding conference was in 19, I think it's up there, 19, December of 1930 in Pittsburgh. They had 20 to 30 delegates, people who had um, committed to being members of the Young Negroes Cooperative League, but they had 600 participants. Just imagine, right? We, I don't think we've ever had as large a black co-op conference since then, and this was in the height of the Great Depression. So how you even got people to Pittsburgh when they couldn't even feed their families, when most people were unemployed, right? Remember this 30 to 40 percent unemployment in the black community, etc. But 600 people came to Pittsburgh to go to a co-op conference called by young radicals. Um, and that's where they elected George Seiler as president and Ella Jo Baker, anyone remember her? This is her early years, 
right? This is 1930, not 1950 or 60. But Ella Jo Baker gets elected to be the executive director. They both live down the street from each other in Harlem, and they run the Young Negroes Cooperative League from Harlem. They run the Young Negroes Cooperative League from Harlem um, in the 1930s. Next slide. So they end up with about 400 members of the height. They have a second conference in Washington, D.C., and talk about a third conference in New York. They end up, as you see the list there, they have councils or um, chapters in New York, Philadelphia, Montessee, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Ohio, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Phoenix, Arizona, New Orleans, Columbia, South Carolina, Portsmouth, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Um, and they do start some co-op stores. They never get to the vision that they have of co-op commonwealth. They wanted to start credit union stores, factories, uh, regional associations, and then the national associations. They never do all that. They do end up with newsletters, co-op education, and um, they end up around a whole era of co-op development in, uh, in the black communities. In fact, Ella Baker wrote a document, I think she documented about 30 co-ops around the country in the 1930s that were owned by black people at that time. Next slide. Their mission was to empower youth and women to really promote a cooperative economic strategy in the black community. And Ella Baker's first speech at that Pittsburgh conference is a a speech about the role of black women in the cooperative movement. So she's already thinking about how important it is to look at women's roles in the black community and to look at women's roles in the co-op movement. And that's what she's promoting most, as well as the um, economic empowerment of youth. Next picture is Ella Baker. The young one, probably closer to when she was in the Young Inca's Cooperative League, and then the one you all know from her sniff years over there. Um, I'm going to skip the Consumers Cooperative Trading Company. That's Jacob Reddick, one of the founders, and I'll do quickly the People's Consumer Cooperative because I don't talk about that one as much. Somebody asked something? Chicago. The Rosenwald Apartments. I don't know if all of you know your history about the Rosenwald Apartments, the Rosenwald Schools, Rosenwald Apartments, and Rosenwald actually held economic conferences. In 1933, Du Bois was actually their keynote speaker, and he talked about co-ops then, too. The Rosenwald apartments were these affordable apartment complexes that African Americans were in, and I think it was a co-op. Um, the members, the residents, created this food co-op called People's Consumer Cooperative Incorporated. They were boycotting the local chain stores in Chicago. They created their own um, uh, buyers club. Then they went and visited the um, co-ops in uh, the one I just skipped over, <laughs> the one in Gary, Indiana, <laughs> and learned from them. And they came back. And by 1937, they opened their first store. The next year, they opened a credit union, and then they um, opened a meat market, and continued to do that throughout the rest of the 30s. They were also able to distribute dividends. So again, that whole notion of sort of a co-op society and multiple different kinds of co-ops existing, connected to their housing, but then becoming a community. Next, I'm also going to go a little bit faster through the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. I mentioned the quotes from uh, A. Philip Randolph and Helena Wilson. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, if you know about them, is considered the first major independent black union, um, at least in the 20th century, because remember, Colored Farmers National Alliance was also an independent black union, but that was before the AFL days. Um, this is the first one created after the act from the New Deal. I forgot what act that's called. Anyway, but in addition to being a union, they also were promoting consumer cooperation, especially credit unions and stores partly because they, again, had this notion of recirculating dollars in the black community. They realized that with the wages the men were getting as sleeping car porters, now that they were unionized, they were actually middle class for un under black standards. 
and the women, especially the ladies auxiliary, was the wives and actually the maids who were in the union, they were trying to promote ways to keep the money, the hard-earned dollars that the sleeping car porters were now making to keep it recirculating in the black community. So they thought about creating credit unions, co-op stores, they created a co-op eye clinic in, in uh, Chicago. One of the first credit unions they created was their chapter in um, Montreal, Canada. Uh, they created study groups all through the chapters all around the country to study cooperative economics and really talk about the importance of having these co-ops to really, as I said, keep, keep money circulating among African Americans and not letting their money, their hard-earned money, go out, um, out of the community and out to white groups. Um, next slide. So the Ladies Auxiliary actually, very early on, asked their members every year to actually read co-op materials. So they had them subscribing to the um, Clusa magazine called Cooperative Something. They had them reading co-op articles and things like that, again, as a way to understand what was happening in the co-op world and how to help them to move toward creating cooperatives themselves. And so the study circles were really important as well as the creating some co-ops when they could. Next slide is the study circle. And then let's get to the Further in the 20th century, I'll quickly do the Black Panther Party, and then um, the Jackson Kush Plan, and then we'll end with some youth examples. Does that sound good, or are you guys bored already? You can hang out a little bit longer. <laughs> okay, so the Black Panther Party. Again, another group that you don't think about co-ops when you think about them, right? You think about gun toting by any means necessary self-defense. But what else were they doing for self-defense? They actually realized they needed a whole community development program. And if you look, there's actually a book out now which lists all 30 of their community projects. But almost all of them were some kind of collective, cooperative, mutual aid kind of programs. And the point was that they said, we're trying to create a new society, but while we're waiting, to be able to get this new society going, we have to survive, and we need to survive in the way that we want our new society to be, which means helping each other, working together, etc. So not only did they do the, the, break, the free breakfast programs, and during the free breakfast programs, they're actually teaching children, right, not just black history, but about how to create a better world and a better system. They had free health clinics. They had, um, free transportation for the elderly, free transportation to the prisons. They had shoe factories, they had, uh, sorry, cooperative shoe factories, they had cooperative uh, bakeries, they had a collective news program, which is one of the ways they made money. They actually created newspapers that they sold on the streets, but the newspaper business that they created was a co-op. They did co-housing. And it goes on and on and on, as I said, there's about 30 programs if you look at them. And so they're actually practicing cooperative economics as they were a political party, right? That was part of their strategy. And as they were doing the other political, social change stuff they were trying to do, they were living and practicing cooperative economics as best they could. I was at once on a panel with a woman who wrote a book about their health clinics. One of the things that I cannot forget that she said was when she went to the, um, the library at Berkeley that houses the papers, most of the papers for the Black Panther Party, and asked them where their pictures were of the Panthers in the health clinics and Panthers in um, doctors, what do you call it? Scrubs. Scrubs. They told her, and this was like five years ago, four or five years ago now, they told her that it was the first time anyone had ever asked them to see those pictures. They're always asked for the pictures of the guns and the guys standing, you know, defense stuff, but they've never been asked about the community support stuff. Um, so luckily she put a bunch of those pictures in her book, so they're out there now. But that's, anyway. That's the Black Panther Party, so again, this notion of the connection between um, political, social, and economic 
uh, justice and that you really have to have all of them operating together. Next, I'm going to skip the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, but it's our lo largest, longest living um, regional association of cooperative development for African Americans. It's 51 years old. It's housed, headquartered in Atlanta and spans seven states. Let's do the Poor People's Corporation. Yes. So in 65, also similar to what the Black Panthers were doing in Jackson, Mississippi, the SNCC had orchestrated a People's Corporation project, which again was creating cooperatives. They had 13 producer cooperatives, a marketing co-op, a, a sewing, leather, and wood grounds, over 800 members, most of them were former sharecroppers moving back into the city. And again, this was sort of a survival plan, but also a notion of this is how we need, what we want to do to live together, etc. And then, next slide, fast forward to the 21st century when we get Mayor Chakwe Lumumba in Jackson, and then trying to create, recreate, actually even do better than what the um, Jackson Poor People's Corporation did in the 60s, but have another, again, a whole municipal, municipally led program to do, especially worker co-ops in Jackson, Mississippi, a predominantly black city, right? To have the mayor's office be supporting technical assistance and incubation of co-ops and co-op education, having the mayor's office help transition semi-autonomous city government agencies into co-ops, especially starting with sanitation, um, and the whole, are we up to Jackson Coast? Yes, sorry, couldn't remember if I told you to move to that slide. Um, so again, the whole sort of notion of a co-op commonwealth again. Unfortunately, Mayor Lumumba died before he was able to get much of this off the ground. And now his son is mayor and they're trying to recreate it, but meanwhile, um, and a, a separate group, Cooperation Jackson, created the Jackson Cush Plan and are trying to move forward with the ideas that Mulumba had without as much support from um, the city government as before. But again, the notion of they're doing urban farming, they're trying to connect with the farmers outside of Jackson, they, they have a learning center, they've got a worker-owned cafe, they're trying to do a worker-owned sanitation company, et cetera. So they're trying to continue that notion of multiple interlocking cooperatives in a municipality with municipal support as much as possible. Municipal support including education, loan funds, and um, technical assistance. So we'll see, we're hopeful about what will happen with that. Next slide. Next slide. Um, and then quickly I'll just mention, remember the Movement for Black Lives included in their 2016 platform, Cooperative Justice, sorry, an economic justice plan which included cooperatives and cooperative development and they're still trying to flush out what they mean by that. Next slide. So again we see, sort of like with the Black Panthers, sort of like with the um, Colored Farmers Alliance, this connection, right, not only do we have to protect our own lives and be anti-police uh, brutality and anti-oppression, but we also have to have economic justice, economic democracy to make these things work. And so I want to end with this notion of young people learning, taking charge, and creating these kind of co-ops. Next slide. When I study the black youth co-ops throughout history, we find out how much they were able not just to teach business skills, um, and industry skills, but also reinforce math and writing and reading, develop leadership and mentoring, build relationships with adults, and provide some income for the young people. And I've got two quick examples. Um, next slide. One is Food from the Hood, which lasted, I think, about 15 years, but I don't think they're still operating. South Central LA, right after the Rodney King rebellions. They're trying to connect to rebuild and helping to rebuild their neighborhoods. They start a school garden. They start out giving the food away free to the homeless in their neighborhood. They learn about farmer's markets, start selling in the farmer's market. They start to learn some business skills and realize that if you 
create value added, you can make more money. So they decided to make salad dressing out of some of the herbs that they grow in the garden. They create a salad, their salad dressing line. I think it's three different flavors. They call it food from the hood. They start selling it. They form themselves as a cooperative. They actually sell through the very fledgling Amazon internet because that way they can sell virtually. So they use the new Amazon, you know, this is 1992, so Amazon is just starting. They connect with the Amazon. They sell their produce through Amazon. Sorry, not their produce, their product, their salad dressing. The interesting thing that's really exciting about that is that they voted that half of their profits should go into a college scholarship fund. And then remember these are high school kids. So by the time they have members who are graduating, they actually have enough money to go on to high school. So their graduates now start thinking about, I'm sorry, they have enough money to go on to college. So gra these high school graduates who are in this co-op are now thinking about college and able to afford it. A side comment about that is once their school sees that they have youth who actually now have money to go to college, they start a college prep program. So again, you see all these connections, right? So the young people, you know, trying to make change in their neighborhood, changing their own lives, raising, creating money, right? generating income, using it to do something more, and then the adults coming and supporting that, new things happening in their, in their schools. And I think, as I said, it lasted about 15 years, which is a pre pretty nice, pretty good strategy. And then the last one is toxic soil busters. <laughs> Who can't love the name? This one is, again, solving community problem. Young people solving community problem. This time, the community problem is lead poisoning, not from the paint, but from the brown fields in their backyard. So toxic soil busters. These are teenagers who are seeing their younger siblings get lead poisoning because they're playing in their backyards. They start learning about lead poisoning. They join an environmental justice, environmental racism campaign in their neighborhood against the brown fields, et cetera. They learn how to do the soil testing. Actually, they find a place to send soil to be tested, but they learn how to take the samples. And then they teach themselves lead abatement processes, doing raised beds, what kind of vegetation to put to pull the lead out of the soil. And they create this co-op that does uh, lead poisoning education and lead abatement processes. And so at first they realized they had to train people. Thank you so much. They had to train people themselves in how to do lead abatement, but they also had to talk to their community about what the problem was before people would hire them to do the lead abatement. So they end up doing skits, and then they realize they want to do videos, so they also teach themselves video production. Um, and they create a whole business, mostly from a summer program at a nonprofit called Worcester Roots. Um, so anyway, the education piece, the video production, then the lead abatement process itself, and if you go to the next picture of them, you see they've got the, um, <laughs> the creativity, right? They're toxic soil busters. Um, so the other thing, again, it's really interesting when you meet some of these young people to see the, mature, the maturity, right? They're running their own companies. They're earning money, et cetera. I remember one young lady was telling us one day, you know, it was really hard to still sit in a high school classroom, you know, because here they are running their own business and train, you know, training people on stuff and that they still have to sit there and be treated like babies. Um, and then they were upset because some of them weren't wanting to run for the board of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives when they were under 18, but nonprofit law, you have to be 18 or over to be a board member. So they were upset about that. Anyway. You can see how you know, running their own company then made them very sophisticated and mature enough to do a whole lot of other things, including complain about the rules. Uh. <laughs> so, I think I'm done. I might have a summary slide. Yes.
So those are the accomplishments. I think we kind of mentioned all those accomplishments already, right? Not just the quality goods and services, saving costs, increasing incomes, combating discrimination, increasing stability, creating jobs and saving jobs, providing independence, developing wealth, and developing leadership. And then my last slide is about transformation, that the co-ops have really helped people to transform themselves, their societies, the kind of work they do, especially worker co-ops have been able to really transform the nature of work, etc. And so that's why we talk about the importance of cooperatives as part of a liberation movement and why we talk about economic justice as being as essential as any of the other pieces of the justice fight. Thank you, I think I have one last slide together, we can win. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I, I actually am a, a registered lobbyist in the cannabis space. I run a consumer nonprofit who work with a lot of black and brown folks, farmers, vets looking to get into this new legalized space. And we actually successfully passed a cannabis co-op license here in Massachusetts. So, um, um, however, the issue I'm seeing um, as someone who works in policy is the barriers to entry at the political level for co-ops. Um, you know, I feel like some, a lot of elected officials only know capitalism. They don't really understand co-ops. And also, um, I read your book, like I told you when I saw you, you changed my life. Um, it's the youth I've decided that I need to focus on. The older the black person, they're also more likely to be interested in capitalism. So I'm curious, how do we get more youth involved in the co-op movement? Um, and is there a way to also get, once they're in the movement, show them how important poli political advocacy is as well? I guess it's a two-part question, but thank you. Yeah, so um, that's one of my pet passions, is how to get young people more involved in, in the co-op movement. Um, I've actually been known to rant against kindergarten, and I guess now I have to say why. <laughs> um, I think we have to start teaching people as early as possible about co-ops and how to operate in co-ops and how to work together and do conflict resolution and do consensus building, whatever. And um, one of my problems with kindergarten is that it's really the place where we start to teach young people how to be the capitalist workers, right? We teach them how to sit quietly, how to listen, and regurgitate what they hear, right? You're not supposed to touch your neighbor or talk to your neighbor. In fact, by, kid, by first grade, if you collaborate with someone that's cheating, right? So then how do we expect them to learn how to collaborate and cooperate in business if, you know, in school where they spend most of their lives, they're told not to, you know, don't talk to your neighbor, don't touch anybody, don't do this, right? So if we really want to change stuff, I think we have to start in preschool and kindergarten and really teach them to be cooperators and to understand how to work together and how to get multiple voices and how to make decisions together and how to do stuff. So I don't know exactly how we change kindergarten because, you know, most people love kindergarten. <laughs> like, people give me these looks like, Are you really? is she the one that really says, you know, we have to get rid of kindergarten, but you know, I, the good stuff about kindergarten we can leave. <laughs> so I think, we, but we do have to rethink education. I mean, the thing that's on our side though, is if you read the latest pedagogy stuff, most of the latest thinkers in pedagogy are back to talk about how we need to work together, how people peer learning, right? Peer-to-peer -peer learning is the most effective way to learn, that people learn better in groups, etc. So we're actually starting, if you really listen to the educators, it's not happening in the schools, but at least the theorists have now come back to that notion that we really need to get people working together and learning together. So we need to figure out how to promote that better. Then I think we need to do um, after-school stuff, right? We need co-op academies everywhere. We need. We need these um, in-school stuff, we need these nonprofits after school, we need right, to be doing this, any of the other stuff we do, you know, we could do it, have a soccer game, but then have an hour of co-op stuff. <laughs> or collectivize the soccer teams or whatever. Anyway, it seems like we've got to figure out how to put co-ops into all the things we do with our young people. The other thing about training young people more is that parents come out. 
right? They want to see their young people do stuff. So if the young people start a business or have the stuff, the parents are going to be there, usually. Um, so I think that helps us with getting the parents there. And the policy side, actually, again, a lot of the successful co-ops, like Cooperative Home Care Associates, actually part of their whole process was to do policy as well. The way that they were able to get people to pay living wages to home care people is because they actually formed a coalition with all the home care businesses in New York State, especially New York City, and got New York City and New York State to reallocate Medicaid money, more Medicaid money to home care. So the whole industry was raising its prices so that their higher prices were competitive because the whole industry raised their prices. Federation of Southern Cooperatives negotiated advocates all the time for the farm bills and other stuff with the federal government to increase money to co-op development, money to small farms, that kind of stuff. So I think as we do co-op training, we have to remind people that there's that piece of it too, that you've got to advocate for the policies at the same time that you're doing this stuff. And sometimes I think the people who are practicing Econ cooperative economics, we actually know better from the practice of it what kind of policies we need. So if we do the practice first and then suggest policies from experience, I think we come from a stronger place. Did you want to say something? Oh. Thanks for your question. So I'm uh, Ines Trezo, and first I want to say thank you for talk talking about peer learning as I teach at Salem State uh, currently and there's a lot of that's from my pedagogical approach, and there's a lot of unlearning that has to happen at the college level with exactly what you described. One of the, one of the things that you talked about that really caught my interest was the color of the national color farmers national alliance had to have a white executive director to do the negotiation. And so on the one hand, you could say that oh, that's kind of an early example of a white ally, uh, which white folks really do need that kind of model, right? But I'm curious to what extent, if you can, if you know, um, if you could speak to the kind of tensions and conflicts that were there in that relationship and, and maybe how some of it was overcome in that relationship of having the white face, having the negotiation on behalf of uh, people of color. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question, also. Um, so, yes, we obviously believe we want allies, we want white allies, we want coalitions. Um, for the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union, it was, as my understanding from everything I read, it was a continuous tension. So it was sort of pragmatic. They needed it pragmatically, and it sort of worked. Um, but it was always a tension because even though, as we said, pragmatically it was the only way to get some of the negotiations going and to get them seen as a legitimate organization, it also perpetuated the notion that they can't lead themselves, even though, as we said, this was a huge, right, a, a huge effective organization during its time. But yet it still had that notion, well, of course it has to be run by a white guy because black people couldn't possibly do that. So in some ways, it undermined everything they were doing at the same time that it was making it possible for them to do what they were doing. Um, it looks like as things were going bad, as the organization was dying, which was in the late 1880s, partly it was dying because of the white supremacist terrorism against them, it was also, it looks like it was partly dying because the tensions between the white leadership and the rank and file were getting worse. There's a, um, a cotton worker strike that happens that apparently the, their executive director called it, and so it became associated with the Colored Farmers Alliance, but it actually wasn't a Colored Farmers Alliance project. Um, but he called it, a, got his name now. Anyway, he called it, it was kind of a failure, and so there's some speculation that if he hadn't been, if, yeah, that it helped people to feel like the alliance was not successful and that the alliance was being run by rogue people or whatever. So I think some of the problem is who the leadership is and what the leadership is. Some of it is how people perceive it, right, again, thinking that if you don't have it, 
I think the, the, for me, I think the lessons that come out of that kind of an example are that, again, maybe you need some kind of co-leadership so that the ally can be the face or the negotiator in those very specific pragmatic cases, but the ally is never seen and never given the power to be the total one running everything. So somehow if you have some kind of co-leadership or a leadership council or something, then people have their roles when necessary, but it's still all more jointly and much more predominantly um, the group that you're supposed to be promoting. So I think that's the big piece. Another thing I sometimes say, because I think sort of underlying your question is, yeah, what is the role of sort of integrated um, interracial movements? And you know, I, I definitely believe that our ultimate goal is a human movement. We're all in it together and we're all doing it together, but I do kind of, I resonate to that Du Bois strategy that the subaltern groups really need to get themselves together first and control and run their own stuff and then make coalitions with other people who are doing the same thing with their groups and then from those positions of strength and wealth you then come together with some kind of equality but that we have to be uh, accepting of and patient of the this, this segregated pieces because you can't there's no, in an unequal system, you can't just say, okay, we're all equal and we're all partners and try to go about that, right? You've got people who really have to become equal. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm kind of babbling about this, but I really believe that we've got to figure out how to undo the inequality before we talk about total immersion in joint projects, because I think it's unrealistic to think that with all the racism and inequality that we have, that just saying that we're all together and doing this together, it's not enough, I don't think. I think we have to let each group find their own strengths and leadership and build themselves up to an equal partner, and then the equal partners all equally, then our final, ultimate society is a human, human, humane society. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian Manuel. Um, I'm a law student here originally from Mississippi. And just want to thank you for bringing your work to us today. We really appreciate it. Um, a question I have as we talk about economic justice is um, we talked about the other forms of political or social justice. I'm really interested in issues of criminal justice, specifically to think about what, when we talk about economic justice, how often capitalism is enforced through police violence. So as we talk about this type of work, interested in either hearing historical examples of how folks who are building solidarity economies or cooperative movements have thought about how does that interact with the existing police state or creating alternatives um, for keeping each other accountable to one another or just in general being able to operate in a system that is so often enforced with violence. Yeah, great, that's a great question. Um, so I've been struggling with that too. Um, if you heard it, and if you you know, it's, you might not have heard all of it because I had a long bio, but um, technically my title at John Jay is Professor of Community Justice and Social Economic Development, and it was an attempt to connect sort of what we call community-based approaches to justice and solidarity economy development together. I'm still struggling with what that really means in terms of alternatives to police and policing and police violence, but one of the things, and I still haven't really published anything on it, but I've been trying to argue is that we can't really have public safety if we don't have economic prosperity among, you know, in our communities. And so creating these structures that give us control over our own economy can help us also to create public safety and in some senses police ourselves. I'm toying with whether I believe in a cooperative police system or not. I, I think it has possibilities, but I haven't quite figured out how we would do it, whether it would really work or not. But I think that might be an important thing to think about. I think also, um, all, you know, other kinds of alternatives. You know, I've been learning about the. Um, sentencing circles and things like that that some 
uh, native groups have done. I think we need to put together sort of a whole menu of different ways that people self-police and do the policing that's much more, right? But I am also one of those believers that we would reduce a lot of our need for policing if we had prosperous communities where people were uh, owning and running businesses together and making it so that we all had what we needed to live, right? right? So I really do believe that, but I'm not naive enough to say that that's all we need. And again, we, it's going to take decades, even probably longer, to get to a system where we're all, everybody's prosperous and everybody's working together on that. So we, in the meantime, right, what do you do? So I think we do need to figure out more humane ways. We need to stop police from being able to do the kind of violence that they do against our people. So some of it is going to still be advocacy and fighting and demonstrating, but also more of us need to kind of put together what we think the alternatives should look like and have to get places that will let us try those alternatives, right? Um, there are not a lot of examples, or I did not find a lot of sort of solidarity or economy or collective uh, examples of taking charge. The closest thing is like the neighborhood watch kind of stuff, where people police themselves, but that's still kind of violent, right? So it's not really, I don't think it's totally the answer we want, but it is more about self-policing as much as we can think that might work, but then the problem is how do you professionalize that and how do people get trained to do that? So I think we're still working on that. I would actually, you know, I'm a, uh, an academic and a researcher, so my first thought is to get people together in a conference and let's start sharing best practices and ideas and talk about these things, you know, from a real perspective of really trying to make change, because um, I think that might help. I am working right now on worker co-ops in prisons owned by incarcerated people. That's sort of my other new passion, aside from changing kindergarten. Um, and that one, you know, is problematic too, because some people say it's just reform. You're just gonna make your life in prison a little bit better. I actually am hopeful that it's more than just reform. And I think it is important if you have incarcerated people owning their own co-ops that that could transform prison as well as transform the people. So I'm hopeful about that. Um, the examples in Puerto Rico really excite me because those are the ones where they're totally controlled by incarcerated people themselves, not by outsiders or other um, correction officers. So I think there's something there, but again, we still need to think about it much more clearly. And then it's also not clear whether it's legal in the United States. And every state has different laws about it. So it's going to be a hard, you know, it's not like just getting a federal law passed. Any place we do it, we're going to have to study what the state laws are and how to handle that. Because it's state co-op laws and state laws about prison ownership stuff. So. Um, but I think, again, that if the more we think out of the box about those kinds of possibilities, the better chance we have to do something. Um, okay, <laughs> shaking your head like maybe you have something to add. No. <laughs> oh, we still have a line, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Come Hi. on. Uh, thank you again both so much. Um, my question is actually for Charlotte. I was. I think it's very rare, in my experience, that artists have the ability to travel so much and to show their work in so many different places. And I don't know if you showed this particular film that we got to see in uh, across the Americas and in all the other uh, countries and continents that were mentioned. But I'm really curious about how the reception of your work differs. Um, you know, whether you're showing it in Boston, whether you're showing it somewhere else across the globe. Um, again, not sure if you toured with this specific film, but. Well, well, it's related to it, I can add to it so that you can answer both of them. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, my name is Kirmai. Uh, about your movie, really, I didn't quite get it, but I can also relate to it. For example, I'm an immigrant from Eritrea, and when I see in the street all these mothers, you know, they came here and wearing, you know, their own, you know, traditional clothes, 
and walking together, I can feel that they are out of space. And I know what it feels to be one black guy and white. You know, for me, it's common, you know? But for someone who doesn't speak the, the language, who doesn't really understand the culture, um, it just kind of feels like your movie, the, the, the thing that I saw, seems a little bit related. So if you can explain a little bit, you know, what is it about, you know, what made you really kind of create that? Thank you both for your questions. And I just want to say thank you for, like, having this event. This is kind of incredible. Nia, I mean, amazing work. And all of you for showing up. It's, it's actually quite moving. Um, I, I, I teach theater over at MIT, and, I, and I'm always telling my students about the importance of community and building communities that um, accept you for who you are and what your ideas are and where you can speak freely. So it's really great to be welcome to be a part of this one tonight. You also for your um, for your work um, so important. Um, okay, so I'll try to say uh, succinctly what the film is about. So um, back in 2017, um, I got asked by my collaborator on this film, who's a visual artist, Abigail Deville, if I would work with her on something that uh, a big, large scale project she was doing at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, and um, she has been working with this. Uh, speech from Martin Luther King's Mountaintop speech for um, a while in, in some of her recent projects. And so I decided that um, I wanted to take, we've been collaborating for years and always, um, you know, my role as director is to try to like get her work um, integrated with people so that it's not just like you're looking at art on the walls, but actually in an audience can feel invited into that. And so, um, this, the title of the movie is called Only When It's Dark Enough You Can See the Stars. That's a line from uh, King, uh, Martin Luther King's Mountain Top speech. Uh, he gave it the night before he was assassinated. Um, and so within that speech, he talks about, like very eloquently as always, but like really what was moving to me about that speech, specifically different from all his other speeches, is that he talks about um, having uh, a dream and meeting the creator and you know standing at the steps of the creator's door and the creator asking him what period of time would you like to live in and you know of course he's in the 60s and we understand all the arguments and the, the struggles that black people were facing or people in general poor people were facing back then because he had already initiated his poor people's movement right and so um, he it's it's such a beautiful speech i encourage you all to go and listen to it um, but Within the speech, he goes back to you know uh, Aristophanes, and he goes back to meeting Martin Luther, and you know meeting all these incredible people throughout times, watching the pyramids get built, and he decides that actually where he wants to sit is exactly where he is at the last few decades of the 20th century. And why? He says because only when it's dark enough you can see the stars. Only in the darkness can we actually start to begin to see other possibilities for change. And um, that just moved me incredibly. And so um, the film is a combination of, of taking that speech and being inspired by that speech. And you know, he says, he repeats almost like a mantra throughout the speech, but I would go on, but I would go on, but I wouldn't stop there, but I wouldn't stop there, right? It keeps coming and coming. I, I feel like that's very much a mantra that um, uh, my people have followed through time memorial, right? It's like we just keep going, we don't stop there, we keep it moving. And so the idea for these two beings to come around was uh, for me really thinking about um, the experience of people traveling from, uh, traveling from the west coast of Africa in slave ships and imagining what that would have meant that you arrive. Not only are you stolen, right? You're captured, you are, um, you know, held in dungeons for two weeks to three months, maybe longer. If you're a woman, you're probably raped. If you're a man, you're probably sodomized in some way or beaten up. And then you pass through that experience and they stick you in a ship where you're attached to people who are maybe from your, maybe from your ethnic group, maybe not. Maybe you speak their languages, probably not. 
but you're chained, you know, like you're chained together. And people, excuse my language, but people are pissing and defecating and having their menses. And it's all, it's like the most kind of, uh, that experience, when I put my mind in that experience, my body gets shivers because I can't imagine going through that. I can't imagine putting another person through that, nor can I imagine watching people go through that. So for me, um, Abigail has been creating, Abigail and I have been creating for a very long time, for I guess five years now, these processions. Um, and that, those kind of backpacks that the performers were wearing in the movie, that is part of that long procession. We've, we've done those processions in Anacostia, in Baltimore, in New York. We want to continue to do them. But this was a kind of way of talking about all the things that you would take with you, whether it's memories, whether it's your pots and pans, whether it's like a picture, and imagining our ancestors not having the possibility to take those kind of grounding things with them that reminded them of home and just taking whatever they had on them. And so for me, it's like these two wandering souls trying to find either home or like home in whatever state that means, home in the largest kind of capacity of the idea. Um, this, so that's where this film is, and, and so a lot of the imagery that goes into outer space or that flashes back, like the mango eating, I feel like there's um, uh, uh, African people living in the diaspora, we are inherently spiritual, whether or not you participate in any organized religion. I think there is this, this connection to like the heavens and to the earth, um, as well as linear time, that we're constantly always uh, trying to negotiate and always trying to find home in. Also, in our um, living in the diaspora, and being one of the diaspora, feeling uh, like, I don't want to participate any longer in the narrative. Ooh, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't want to participate in the narrative that I, my body is, my, my story is only half being told and that my story starts with trauma. I know my story doesn't start with trauma. I have too many beautiful people in my community and in my world, and I've been passed on too many gifts to believe that it's like trauma is the beginning and the end of where our story ends. So for me, I, this movie is my first film. I am a stage director, and so this is like the beginning of my process of making films. This film has been screened, so at the Whitney, uh, it was screened at the um, American Academy in Rome, and this summer uh, we got the opportunity to screen it in uh, Ghana for the Chalewate Festival, which was like the most incredible thing ever, um, because, you know, really to start these, have these conversations with, um, with Africans who are living in Africa and trying to, you know, um, share our struggles, I think is really something that me growing up, um, I'm Canadian, my parents are from Barbados, um, I've been living in America for about 11 years, and I've lived in different places in the world, um, and worked in different places in the world, and for me, uh, the only way we're going to actually move forward is through this kind of cooperative, we go together, pan-African, pan-people <laughs> movement forward, because we gotta live here together. There's no way that I'm gonna eat, and you're not gonna eat, and there's gonna be any level of equality in this world. There's like, like it's just not gonna work that way. So for me, this, you know, it's the first film, it's the beginning, um, it's the beginning of a process. Um, I am gonna go back. Um, I'm working on a film right now that is looking at my family and the transatlantic slave trade, and I'm filming in um, Barbados, where my family is from, in England, where I was born, and in the west coast of Ghana at the slave castles there. And um, the process of creating this kind of um, triangle of creativity for a documentary that is, you know, I can only go so far back in my family history, right? Um, so it's a lot of in intuitive, um, imagining on what that history is, but it feels like very right, and it feels like the right thing to do, you know? Um, and, and so, um, yeah, thank you for watching. I hope I answered your question a little bit, your questions, yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> hey, Charlotte, uh, my name's Claudia Sheehan. Um, I was interested in your transition um, into um, starting to make films and just sort of um, how you felt about the energy of the, um, the 
performance happening um, in different spaces where you're, uh, you know, like when you're, uh, when everyone is uh, surrounded by people versus in um, spaces like on the beach or being in Times Square and just sort of like that different energy and how that felt documenting that and producing a film out of it versus um, being in the theater. Well, thank you for your question. Actually, I, I should explain a little bit more. So this film, when it was shown at the Whitney, was part of a large-scale installation piece. So Abigail, um, my collaborator, she uh, created these large, huge kinetic sculptures and costumes. I should have brought pictures. I didn't. But if you can go to my website, or we can talk after, and I can show you pictures. Um, but it was part of a live event. And so it was scored live as well. So. Um, Michelle and Justin and the, the musicians who worked on the, the music for the for the film, they, they, they performed it live and there were lots of actions going on. I should also say, the woman in the, the film, Okwi Okumpawasili, she just won a MacArthur Award, so that's kind of like huge. She's, for her own work, I mean, she's amazing, so check her out. Um, but yeah, so we did, it, we did it live and so it was part of a live event and that's still very much a part of who I am. The film that I'm working on now, the next one, my, my hope is that when it is done, it will also be uh, able to be presented as a live scale installation with live scoring, but then also exist as a film um, on its own. And, um, you know, part of that is, you know, I love making theater, I love live events, I love like feeling people's energy like right here, right now, but it's also with theater. Once you once the show is closed, it's closed, and so either you saw it and you were there and you got to participate, in it, or you didn't. You know, hear the story or read the review, and so that always that has lately. I guess it's like an age thing that lately has started to like bother me a little bit. Like I want to have something that can go on, so that's kind of partial, partly the other, you know, the ulterior motive to like making films as a person who is a very much a live stage director but who loves uh, cinematography is to like just have something that can exist and you know so I can come here and show you a little something and then talk. Um, in terms of the locations, so that's the brilliance of Abigail DeVille again. She, that beach where they're at is this beach in New York called Dead Horse Bay and it really looks like that. It's a beach that's just covered in garbage and that garbage has been there probably you know, since the 1800s, I don't know, it's just, it's just like, you can go visit, you know, you drive to the end of Flatbush, and then you get out, and then you walk to the water, and it's just like a sea of garbage, and I think another thing that I was thinking about with the film is just like, um, and, and now, like, in retrospect, actually, having gone to Ghana, realizing that somewhere in African DNA is a real community, like, thing, like, there's an injection of like, it is, the community is like how we exist, but then also a connection with nature. And Dead Horse Bay is simultaneously like a really beautiful place, and like, it is, it is the, it, it's terrifying, because everything is dead there, there's nothing alive there. Even we shot some scenes where they were in the water, and they're covered in plastic, because you wouldn't want anything to touch that water. You know, and I think we're really ignoring the environment, and so that was also something that I wanted to just have in the film. But you know, there's this kind of garbage of things, and then the kind of garbage that people put out. All this commercial commercialism. You know, I mean, part of my reason for even making art is so that I could redefine how the the, the world sees me and people who look like me. You know, like I refuse to be defined by the commercial culture. And so for me, like having those two contrasting spaces, and, and there's a third space in the film, the kind of dark room that they're in. And for me, that's really like this dream space of like, what was home like? You know, it's like, there's a child there, they're eating mangoes, they've got their jewels on. You know, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a space of perhaps idealism, or maybe the calm before the storm in some respect. So I hope that, Answers your question a little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely um, on a continuum. And even though you know there's the end of the credits, it just it still is undulating, and you can just still feel that pace and, and what you were talking about with um, the pace speech as well. So um, I'm happy to see it live on in different iterations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I have a 
question. Yeah, this is the last question. <laughs> That's not gonna end. Um, I have one last question about co-ops. Um, so trying to create a movement inside of capitalism. I've been in organizations that have ended because uh, the you know people running the organization got infected with hierarchical structures and patriarchy and things like that. Um, so I wanted to know if you had any insight about longevity uh, to keep this going and um, how to how to keep those toxic mindsets at bay. Thank you. Oh gosh, you guys are asking hard questions. <laughs> Um, that's another one that, um, with the answer, I guess, is complex, and we don't have great answers, but I'll give you some thoughts. Um, the first thing, I think, is the continuous education principle, you know, in the international court principles, I've found to be extremely important, literally, like, you can't stop learning together. So a lot of the co-ops got into problems when they didn't think they needed to keep learning together. Part of it is the new people coming in don't get anywhere near the same kind of education the first people get. They don't even understand why the co-op was started and that kind of thing. If you stop learning together, don't, uh, you lose some of the trust fact, right? Because learning together really helps to build trust and when trust starts to go, you have a chance to rebuild trust and that kind of stuff. So if you don't do enough of the learning. So the strongest co-ops that I found really did have that continuous, some element of continuous learning together. Sometimes they recognized it, um, sometimes they didn't recognize it, but you just, in studying, the case study, you can see that they, some, even if it's only some elements, and then continuing to have really strong orientation for the new people, and continuing to educate your community, your clients, or customers, or the community, because that's the other thing. Sometimes the community starts to take the co-op for granted, and then remember I said the community support for the co-op is also really important. So you can't let the community forget why you're there, or what you're there, or what you're doing there, or that you're a part of the community, because then you lose that connection as well. So um, the education piece, I think, is essential. Um, the other thing, for the African American cooperatives that I studied, they really, um, most of them went under more because of uh, sabotage than because they did or didn't do something internally. So that's the next problem, right? And by sabotage, it could mean no financial support, so that all the banks, you know, agreed not to support the co-op, or it could mean, you know, actual um, white supremacist violence of trying to burn down your co-op or discredit everybody who's in the co-op. So there's all, you know, a whole range of sabotages, but most of the co-ops, from the ones that lasted two years to the ones that lasted 18 years, a lot of why they quote unquote failed or went under was for things outside of their control. But that also means we've got to figure out how to stop the sabotage, right? So that's where having allies, getting more policies, um, educating people about how to defend themselves, making sure the community defends you, right, is also important. Um, then I think the other lesson on the business side is twofold. You know, even though we realize that co-ops are social economic development, so they have a social part, they are still businesses. So you have to make sure the enterprise is strong. So you have to keep, well, that's another part of the keep learning, not just how to run company with other people, but how to keep innovating so you keep your company strong. It still has to make, it has to at least break even, it has to bring in money, it has to cover its costs, it has to perpetuate in some way, so you do have to keep an eye on the business side. 
I mean, the, the hopeful part is when we study co-ops versus other small businesses, co-ops actually last longer than other small businesses. And I think partly it's because two heads are better than one. You know, you've got people sharing the risk, making joint decisions, whatever, but also I think because of all it takes to start it up, right? It takes more to start it up, and so it's gonna take more to end it. So that's the positive side, is they tend to have better longevity than small businesses in general. But we do have to pay attention, I think, to the ways, the things that do undercut it. So not understanding how to work together and make decisions together. I think we all need to do more conflict resolution skills, right? How do you work together when people don't agree? Because that's the other thing, after the founding members, founding members tend to agree because they came together for a very specific reason to create the co-op. But when you, after the founding members, not everybody has that strong sense of mission and why they're there. So then it's even more important to figure out, well, how do you resolve conflict? How do you come to consensus? Things that we don't necessarily think are that important, but really are, I think. But that's still education, so I keep coming down to education, education, education. Um, and then, you know, my, my Pollyanna, my Pollyanna side really believes that the more we have people practicing real cooperation, the stronger we are against the outside forces and even against capitalism, and the more we're gonna force the capitalist system to recede. But I don't honestly know whether that's a 10 or 20 year thing or a 100 year thing, right? But I do believe, especially when you talk to people who are practicing cooperators, it really is a different mindset, and you approach the rest of the world in a different way. Um, and I think the more we support each other in that, right, I think that's gonna, that's gonna be important too, right? So the more we say, okay, well we're not just gonna act this way in our co-op, but we're really gonna demand this in our city council, we're gonna demand it at the PTA, we're our children, you know, we're doing stuff for our children. We're gonna do it in our family, right? Somehow we've gotta practice it other places too and not think it's only that we're gonna do it in our co-op business or in our co-op housing, which I know co-op housing places have a lot of trouble with actually operating cooperatively. But that's again where the challenge is. We need to challenge ourselves to really do it in those settings and then spill it over to any other setting we're in and require ourselves to keep practicing it wherever we are, and I think then we can keep perpetuating it. That's my hope, anyway. Thank you.